Reading is not always um, the most, uh, when you've done enough reading, then you can maybe sketch or paint. Some people choose very gorgeous places to go to, and here, for instance, is a pretty gorgeous place. This is a view of the, of the Shenandoah Valley in, uh, in Virginia. Uh, I painted this by sitting on the side of the road with my great big canvas, and of course I was in a car, so I was able to transport it. There are some other paintings around the studio today. For instance, this one I did when I was in New Orleans. This is a, this is a painting of the old slave quarter in New Orleans, which is now a boutique and a marketplace with very nice uh, home crafts and beautiful baskets and things. That's so, so, and small pictures are the best thing to do when you're on the road. This is Nova Scotia, by the way, a little square canvas with a funny beached old Viking boat. I mean, it's not as old as you might think, but it was a lovely idea to see the boat uh, sitting on the grass, on a grassy hillside. And so, uh, as, as time goes by on these programs, I'm going to talk to you about painting in the summertime. And uh, small pictures uh, are better than big pictures, but big pictures are also always irresistible. Um, today I'm going to do a cloud study. The summertime is the best time to find clouds, and um, uh, went out and shot this scene of clouds, uh, which is, uh, you know, the thing that happens in the skies at this time of year, which is really uh, very important to learn how to decipher what you see in the sky. So. Um, I'm going to lay it out. It doesn't look as though there's much to lay out when you're doing cloud pictures because it's just a whole bunch of fluffy things up there in the in the blue background. But actually, it's a little bit a little bit more complicated than that. And so this is for me to, to point out to you how you do it. I have a blank canvas prepared with a darker color because it's better for the video. And I'm going to take my what I call my tinted turpentine and I'm going to lay out these clouds which I which have been captured on videotape of the Hoyt farm uh, near here. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to give you the horizon line. And the horizon line has a nice curve to it. It runs downhill. Uh, something that everybody should look for instead of just the actual, you know, the straight horizon line. And then the land mass behind it, which has to be, de which, which you can denote with just a wiggly line to show you where those trees and bushes are. We now have a two line composition. We know that it's out of doors and we know that there's a little hill. And we also know that there is going to be something in the foreground, which is more interesting. And that is a tree of a kind of, a, kind of a, well, sort of like a parasol shaped um, uh, mass. And it's intersecting the, um, the hillside and it's got its two or three, there has a two or three stemmed, three uh, trunked base. And then the shadow, of course, has got to be put in. It's very, it's an important part of the composition, especially in the summertime when they are so deep and so vibrant and um, so much a part of the composition because we're dealing in mostly greens and blues in summertime painting. Oh, here we go. Uh, so here we have one shadow, the mass of the tree, the land mass in the back, the little nice little curved line of this lovely green lawn, a path that winds its way up this way, and then the subject at hand, which are the clouds. Well, clouds change, and uh, they go and they come and they billow and then they disappear. So the best thing that you can do is to learn to work very fast and to lay out this cloud. It's possible that uh, in a half an hour, this particular cloud will be an entirely different shape. But I want to show you how to not be intimidated by it and how to just kind of lay this out 
for a design purpose. Clouds sometimes tend to have strange curving lines going towards something. It's the wind patterns that do it. And then there are these amorphous sort of smoky shapes here. And then there are little fellows in the background that sort of manifest themselves. George O'Keefe did a wonderful cloud painting, a huge, huge painting. It's so big that the Museum of Modern Art needed an entire room to show it. And she wanted to show the entire sky. And she did with just endless numbers of little white puffy clouds dancing across the sky. If you ever have a chance to go into the Museum of Modern Art, do go and see the George O'Keefe painting of clouds. It's quite wonderful to see. And it's audacious because it's just, just endless little puffy clouds. So we have here what looks probably like a terrible mess. But I'm going to um, decipher this for you and see if possibly I can arouse your interest to looking at the skies and try to capture something that we live with over our heads for the rest of our lives the sky. And part of landscape painting is extremely dependent upon skies. I'm using some quick drying white. I'm going to mix it right on the canvas. As you can see, um, I, um, I try to get to, the, uh, to simplify the business of painting out of doors. And if you, if you paint and mix your, your paint on canvas out of doors, you will find that the whole process has been much easier. Um, I'm mixing right here. I'm, giving, I'm doing a basic color of the blue, which is towards the horizon. And I'm going to put, in very quick, put it in very quickly. Remember that when you're painting out of doors, speed is of the essence because things change so rapidly. Not only does the wind make it change, but also uh, shadows, sunlight, and weather conditions. So when we are dealing with the, um, with the out of doors, this is the, this is the time when uh, throwing care to the wind, as it were, and being super confident about your application of paint. I'm using a little square cut brush here, which presumably is going to be distributing my paint rather quickly. Um, the uh, business of mixing on the canvas, a lot of people say is an absolute no-no, but I do it because I find that it works well for me. I'm going right over the pattern of my tree because the tree has got sparse leaves at the top and I would see the clouds, uh, see the sky through the little sparse leaves. And so I'm going to put the, um, put the, the coat underneath there, uh, right over the design. What I had to do was simply place the tree where it was. There is, a, there is a white mass behind here, according to my monitor, which is obviously a low horizon cloud, but it's very, uh, it's very indistinct, and we just know that it's a different color. But it doesn't have any shape like the others. Um, there is a book in the library that you might care to uh, look into. It's called Skies and Clouds by, uh, no, uh, Sky, Clouds, and Air by uh, an artist called Everett Sloan. It is a, a book which is vital to the understanding of the anatomy of the sky. And you, everybody always wants to know where they should study. Well, you study, you should study under your own initiative and find these sources of information. And I'm giving you one right now, which is Eric Sloan, a remarkable American painter who put out this lovely book. Now, the sky has become darker at the top. And I've mixed that here on my canvas. It's become darker, and it's going to blend as it goes down. Uh, remember that uh, atmosphere changes color. Way up in the, uh, in the top of the canvas, where the sky is presumably at its highest, which is silly because the sky is not higher in one place than it is in the other, it's simply out there. But, uh, but the illusion and the visuals that I'm talking about, the top part of your canvas is going to have a more intense blue sky because the atmosphere of the land has not gone and thrown at, uh, um, mist and all sorts of distracting colors over it. So it is deeper and darker. Of course, the skies change constantly. Um, this I have to keep repeating, even though everybody I'm sure knows very well that the reason that people don't paint skies very often is because they are so, they're, well, they're very much like children. They change a great deal in their play patterns. Uh, and they jump from one attitude to the other without any warning. But uh, the best that I can do is to demystify the business of painting clouds and also to give you some idea that the challenge of painting sky and clouds should be uh, attended to if you are a serious landscape painter. Well, 
Um, as you as you can tell, I have uh, I have been blending as I go along with deliberate strokes. Please, uh, even though you may have seen programs before where great wide brushes are taken and great blending is done across the canvas with huge brushes, please avoid that at all costs. If you like the looks of my work, uh, I cannot do it that way, and uh, I advise against it because then it begins to look uh, very much like what it does. No good. So, uh, with my opinion firmly in place <laughs> and my continuous job at the business of painting with four-inch house brushes, I'm going to tell you that painting with a smaller brush is far more effective if you are after fine arts. The little deliberate strokes are what, first of all, are going to give it texture, and secondly, it's going to give it um, a, an immediacy that you're going to get uh, by working at it. Um, I have been talking about this for a long time, and I suppose I shall keep talking about it until everybody gets really tired of it, but that's that's okay. That's what lessons are. Lessons are either good or tiresome, or both. Now, uh, clouds are interesting. They, um, they have moods. Uh, I'm working from a monitor. You can see that in the, on your screen, the flag is moving, even though the rest of the scene appears to be absolutely static, as if it were a still photograph. It is not a still photograph. It is a it is a videotape of an area in which there is not a breath blowing, no leaves moving except the flag, which is the one uh, signal to you that we are working from a live videotape. Now, that wonderful cloud arrangement, there's that, you know, the flag against that sky, against that cloud is, you know, irresistible. I have here the, I'm going to apply the more brilliant part of this cloud. And remember, please, that clouds, although they may appear absolutely white, more than likely have got a tinge of something on them, either pinkish, orange, or yellow, but they are rarely pure white because of atmosphere. This maybe, look, maybe looks white on the canvas here, and it may be perfectly acceptable, but I will show you what white is after we've gotten this, um, the, what, what you could call the, the crown or the aurora around that cloud. Um, it is lit uh, very much from the back, known as backlighting. Any photographer has known about backlighting for a long time. And um, it blends a little bit in places with the blue of the sky. The uh, backlighting, of course, is uh, fascinating, and it happens uh, only on occasion. Uh, and when it does happen, that's the time to try to get it on canvas. Uh, the lower part of this particular cloud has got some backlighting way at the bottom, but then there is that wonderful mauveish pinkish gray tone in the center, which I'm using with uh, some, well, ultramarine blue, a touch of ochre, a touch of pink. It's all very, uh, it's very co complicated bunch of colors, but they have to be right. And I've got to tell you that when I do it, I try to name as many of the colors as I'm using when I mix them, because I work with a palette, which is a little bit more, uh, with more numerous colors than you'll find on some other programs. Here is the dark part of that cloud, which is is working its way into the uh, aurora uh, or the nice halo around it and giving you the the color scheme uh, of uh, a summer cloud with activity going on way up there in the atmosphere and the there's no activity down on the land it's calm it's a summer calm day. The clouds are telling you that there is um, mo motion and movement way overhead. Uh, as you can see, working with this brush, with these strokes, can give you the opportunity of doing some very subtle painting, which has to be observed and which is, of course, uh, vital to the business of having uh, n what I call untricky pictures. Um, as when, when I first started this, this painting, this cloud was of a different shape. It's, and we've had some other ones that have joined them and have changed shapes, but for the most part I'm going to continue with what I saw in the beginning because when you're outside and those clouds are changing, there is, uh, you either accommodate or you try to remember what you saw, or you go with the flow and you will find many different uh, clouds together that were not together there, not together in the first place. Uh, may, maybe it sounds um, maybe it sounds a little bit uh, too complex at this point, but I think that when I continue to proceed with this, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, 
and uh, as I say, the whole pattern has changed a great deal. But you, um, what this is meant to do is to uh, tell you a few of the things that must be learned as you're painting out of doors for something as volatile as a cloud and as ever-changing as the sky. Um, I'm going to uh, be needing to squeeze out some more white paint, so I'm going to take just a moment to do that. So I'll take a short, short break. Uh, I'll, I'll be right back. back again with a little bit more paint on the on the uh, uh, palette and raring to continue with this uh, mysterious way of painting clouds. Um, as I said to you earlier, the anatomy of a cloud is continually changing. Therefore, speed is, is, the, is of the essence and also improvisation uh, and observation. Uh, you can make up some of it, but you will wind up finding yourself really going back again and again to the reference material, which is above overhead and um, and giving you uh, uh, some ideas that you may not have had before about clouds because they are there even though they move and they will they, you, you must work from life with the cloud but at the same time you can improvise it's um it probably is uh something that you have to experience on your own and therefore for me to tell you all about it is maybe is is maybe pointless except that i want you to go out there and try it so that you can see here is that diagonal cloud that's coming from who knows where uh i i don't even question where it might be coming from but it's there and it's um it's giving a sort of a nice pattern to the sky it's got some little strange puffy things going on on up there, but it all has to be very, very amorphous and very indistinct because clouds do that. And I have a very large, wonderful flat Chinese brush here, which can dissipate the color and make some blends, which otherwise would probably not not be possible unless you used your fingers. Um, the uh, the quick drying paint is helping this do what it's doing. Uh, the quick drying paint is essential, especially if you're going to do what I talked about earlier, uh, but when this program began about painting on trips. The quick drying paint will dry in a matter of hours instead of a matter of days, and that is important, of course, obviously when you're on the road. Um, I have painted in all sorts of nooks and crannies of the world, and I find that. Um, when I come back with the paintings, uh, they uh, are a, a, better, a better remembrance and souvenir of where I've been than anything I could have bought or been given. So uh, if, there's any, if there's been any kind of a strange little calling in the back of anybody's mind about going and painting on a trip, by all means, do it. Small pictures are probably far more... Uh, wise to attempt than big ones. This is considered a big picture for a travel painting. The little ones that I showed you, this little New Orleans one right here is about the right size. It's about a 9 by 12 or 8 by 10 and it's easily transported, can be put in the bottom of a suitcase and I shall show you 
at the end of this program how to pack a wet painting and lay it down the bottom of a suitcase and then uh, you must convince the customs lady that you painted it. Because if you bought it, you would have to pay an import tax on it, an import duty. So uh, it's always very interesting for me at the airport when I have to convince the people that I did it. Of course, they see my paint box, which is a mess, and they believe it, and they don't want to have anything to do with the paint box. And so I get through, and they, and I usually get some compliments. So it's very, it's a great deal of fun to take my pictures uh, through the customs and to you know, sort of have a show as I'm coming back home again. But uh, that's beside the point. The point is that doing pictures on vacation are, the, um, are a wonderful thing to do, especially when there's a great deal of time. Uh, uh, and that's why you go away, because you have time. And this is the time to take advantage of it in the summer. There's a wonderful kind of a, of a glowing thing here in the background, a little bit to the back of the flag, and it seems to just be glowing back there. It could be the sun catching a cloud, and it's, um, it's something that I certainly wouldn't uh, question, but I do I'm going to try to get that, uh, that uh, wonderful glow that's back there and see if I can blend it into the blue. And then uh, when you go home and you find you're there, you realize, oh yeah, that's the way it looked like. It, it was sort of glowing there in the distance, and you grab it as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, because the effects, as I said before, do not last. The, um, the business of blending the bottoms of clouds into the sky have to be done when you're there. They can't, it should not be done later. And here, for an, for an example for you, let me just blend the bottom of this cloud into the sky and show you how to do it. There's a dark color here on this little cloud down here, and I'm just going to uh, scrumble is the term used, and I'm going to make it sort of blend and marry in with the blue, and th that is many, many times exactly what happens with the bottom parts of clouds. These uh, up here, have got some backlighting in there, and their their blending is a lot less. But that's what makes this particular type of thing uh, really quite fascinating. There is a lot of mauve in the in the gray of these clouds, and some yellow ochre. The color business, the business of of, um, of finding out the color of these things, can only be done when you're out there observing. If you are um, if you are uh, not unsure of your colors, then you can always, with oils, go back and change them. It can't be done with all uh, paints, watercolors. If you've made the mistake, forget it, tear off the page and start over again. But with oils, you can, in fact, correct. Now, I talked about the yellow that I did before, the yellow of clouds, how clouds are rarely, rarely white. And so here is the difference. If the, if, the, if the camera can pick up the difference between the pale yellow and this brilliant white, you will see that you can get a lot more uh, shine to this. If, the, uh, if this part of the cloud is a little bit yellowed, and then you get the pure white above it. Uh, it's just that you have to save pure white for going somewhere else, for being a little bit more highlights later. And I think that, um, I think that it is obvious what I'm saying, that here the, the, the white is even more sun-like uh, because it's next to the yellow. Well, um, the uh, business of introducing the foreground and the background in these pictures is um, all to do with the artist's technique. Color focus and technique are vital when you are doing a band of uh, landmass trees in the back, uh, in the middle ground, as it were. So. I'm mixing up, I don't like to use greens out of the tube, as everybody has heard me say for an awfully long time. I like to use yellows and blues for my greens, and the mixing of these colors of, of green usually takes a little bit longer than any other because of the variety that I use. Now I'm using a sort of a subdued green here for my, uh, for my uh, bank of, of, of trees in the distance, and these small deliberate strokes are uh, in direct contrast to the um, technique of other uh, shows whereby great uh, whacking of the canvas with um, with a brush full of color and hoping that that looks like a tree, I, um, I find myself unable to do that because I like to observe and understand what I'm seeing. And of course, the, uh, the different color focus which take, takes place in these pictures 
is because I'm out there uh, observing it. I could not possibly make any of this up. I, I, I do not have that kind of a visual uh, memory. So even in the distance, this tree is going to have some darkness because there is such a brilliant sun, a br brilliant light overhead. And so even in the, um, in the landmass that's way off in the distance, there is a lot of darkness underneath here. Naturally, this program is going to be done in two sections because it takes it takes more time than a half an hour to do a complete painting of any kind. And so uh, having gone this far, I'm, I'm trusting that maybe I have aroused your interest enough to be able to get you to watch the next time this study of the uh, Hoyt Farm takes place and the study of clouds uh, of a summer day, um, which is uh, the most wonderful time of year for painters to go out and not have to fight the elements. The darkness that is down here where the uh, where the, these great trees and bushes have uh, have been cast in such shadow are very important to this composition because uh, shadows anchor things to the ground. Uh, they also allow you to have sunlight falling from the tree, from this tree, and you have prepared the background for this pale color of this particular, these particular trees here. They must be able to be against a dark background, otherwise you will find that you can't find, there is no, no ability to have any three-dimensional quality to it. So when you put when I put the dark in first, it's to make you understand that there are time, there is a timing in these things. The timing being that you put certain things on first in order to be able to prepare the ground to receive the others. Um, not complicated, a little bit complicated, but eternally fascinating. It's what keeps me at the easel. It's what makes me want to be able to take the entire Shenandoah Valley in the state of Virginia and do it on a canvas. And uh, this is, by the way, the um, migration route of the monarch butterfly. And that's why I have the painting uh, with the butterflies in the foreground, because I think not only is it a lovely view of the, um, of the Massanutten Range back here. This is called the Massanutten Range, but there are the butterflies flying over this wonderful skyline drive. Well. My little travel tour is almost at, an, uh, almost at an end. I want to show you how I transport wet paintings if I have the time. If I don't, I'll show you the next time. But here, let's say, are two pieces of canvas, and they both have wet paint. Wet paint here. This is the way you transport them. I make little, little, little sandwiches. These are sticky things from tape, and you put them in four, in six places on your canvas, like this. You will place them this way, and uh, this is the wet side. You'll have to retouch these spots here, of course. I'll show this. I'll do this again. And here are the, here are the little pieces that I put on. And lo and behold, voila, here is a sandwich whereby the wet, this is a wet painting, and this is a wet painting, and you put them together and they travel with an air space between them so that the paints don't touch one another and so that you can put this in the bottom of your suitcase put things on top of it, and when you get back, all you do is to retouch those six places that have the little little buffer things. Wow, simple. It's uh, something that you ought to know. Thank you for watching. This is the beginning of a painting called Cloud Study. Please watch the next time, and thanks for watching this time. Bye-bye. This is Pat Winder at the Cable Easel.